What's up Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another Missable Details video. Today we're discussing the most recent uh, release and one of my personal favourites in the entire series, which is Frenny Face, a book with one of the creepier covers of them all and, in my opinion, the best book in the series. Guys, I had to reread this entire story for this video alone, and this one is actually kind of one of the longer ones as well. So I really hope you appreciate my effort in making this video, and make sure that you subscribe if you enjoy it. Anyway, let's get straight into what you missed in Friendly Face. Of course, as always, we should start with the title Friendly Face, um, which of course is referencing the service Fazbear Entertainment are giving out to people mourning over the deaths of their pets. In this context, it's called a friendly face because it uses the face of a lost pet on an animatronic, but after reading the story, it's almost wordplay as the face put on Edward's animatronic was truly a friendly face, the face of an old friend. But also something that I want to point out is how the acronym for the book is the same as the acronym for the whole series. Meaning if you're texting someone in a hurry saying that you're reading the story friendly face, then you could just say you're reading FF from FF in FF. Speaking of the books, the cover of this one, as I previously mentioned, is one of the creepiest ones in my opinion. It's up there with 1.35am and Blackbird. To add to the creep factor, allow me to point out something that I didn't see for ages until it was pointed out to me by Psychic. The fact that the face on the cover has these haunting veins around the outside, they're branching out. A possible early clue that something is up with this animatronic. It's also possible this presents the idea of is this dead or alive, which is a topic we'll go on to soon. Another detail I was told by Cuban Fancy was that the one you should not have killed from Ultimate Custom Night has a suspiciously similar face structure to that of the cover. Now it's very possible that this was unintentional, uh, but it really helps out a theory that seemed to be presented in the story about Cassidy, assuming Cassidy is the one you should not have killed. Straight into the story, we learn that Edward is a science nerd, a bit like yours truly, and he asks the question, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? Which is an old paradox originating from the third century BC, an unstoppable force would mean infinite energy doing work at the object, and an immovable object is an object with infinite mass. From Newton's second law of motion, we know that force is mass times acceleration, so acceleration is infinity over infinity, which is undefined. And it's quite an interesting paradox too when you look into it. They have to write essays on this paradox, and in class they've been taught about magnetism and surface tension, different kinds of forces, and Edward tries to think of an unstoppable force as the school bus. Almost like the unstoppable force of the truck later that kills Jack and Faraday. You could even think of death as an unstoppable force. While Edward is of course movable, because as Julia says, you can't have a universe with both an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Okay, enough about that stupid paradox. A big detail that was mentioned near the start was the fact that Jack was always smiling. Edward points out that naturally Jack's lips are upturned and he always has a grin on his face, possibly giving further meaning to the phrase fen friendly face. Jack wasn't just a friend, he was a friendly friend. <laughs> he was an FF in FF in FF of FF. They get off the school bus and investigate hissing only to find that there is a cat that Jack decides to call Faraday after English scientist Michael Faraday, who as Jack rightfully states, discovered the two laws of electromagnetic induction. The first is about the EMF of a conductor in a magnetic field, and the second concerns the rate of change of flux linkages. In other words, this dude found out a lot about electromagnetism and founded the electric motor. But this kind of science leads me to think of one thing, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, and the conception that electricity could revive the dead. These days we use high voltages of energy in defibrillators to get the heart pumping again, and neuroscientists apply electric currents into the brain to boost mental function. 
I need that. I think the fact that the cat is named after a scientist who worked a lot in electrochemistry is ironic, knowing that it in some form gets revived in an electric form, in an animatronic form. But the thing I found weird about this scene is how Jack tells Edward about him and the cat. He mentions how he is establishing a bond with Faraday and how Edward would be included when the connection is solidified. Those lines, of course, do foreshadow later events. Jack and Faraday almost become one. I know Faraday's hair or fur wasn't really put in, wasn't really used to make the friendly face, but the friendly face is supposed to look like the animal. So you, you could say that they're both one. So I, I really like how the beginning of the book kind of uh, do, does show Jack and Faraday with that connection as soon as they meet. We then find out that Jack has been into physics ever since he was first able to read, but then he calls out a specific branch of physics, quantum physics. As the book puts it, his understanding of quarks and atoms dwarfed that of any of their teachers. Uh, he loved talking about duality, the fact that quantum entities existed as waves and particles at the same time. Who would have thought that FNAF would be so educational? Quantum physics really fascinates me too. I'm literally reading a book on it as we speak. Well, not as we, as, what? There is one thing in quantum physics that I want to call out directly. Schrodinger's cat. This was also mentioned later on in the story, so it's okay to use this as like a parallel kind of thing. If you don't know what Schrodinger's cat is, it's basically a thought experiment where if you put a quantum cat in a quantum box that has a 50% chance of dying in an hour, is it dead or alive after the hour? Quantum physics actually says that it is both. And it's here where I want to come back to the point that the animatronic cat also holds the duality of being dead and alive. It's a cat, sure. And it seems to be alive, but is it really alive? There's also the duality of is it human or is it a cat? Eh, it's a bit, bit of both. Agony and Remnant is what seems to keep the dead alive and the alive dead. I'd even say Agony and Remnant are the concept of life and death together. So that's something to think about with the whole sciencey theme of the story. Jack had a pet goldfish called Cousteau, uh, perhaps a nod to French explorer Jacques Cousteau. Uh, it's actually kind of ironic how his first name is similar to Jack, uh, Jacques. Cousteau is well known for exploring the oceans and studying life forms in water, as well as helping to create self-contained underwater breathing apparatus or scuba. I don't think this means anything to the story, it's just a joke because the fish is named after a naval explorer. Moving to the beginning of the good part of the story where we find that Faraday is clawing at a monarch butterfly. Now as we are told, butterflies start as caterpillars that undergo metamorphosis into a chrysalis and then the beautiful colours of a butterfly. But there's two big points here that I want to talk about with this being a monarch butterfly. Firstly, monarch butterflies look like this, kind of your standard butterfly. And it's clear why a cat might think that this is a falling leaf. However, to many people, monarch butterflies represent rebirth and an afterlife, where there is life in a different form after death. So it's quite fitting here that it is a monarch butterfly that leads Jack and Faraday to their death, but then to their afterlife. The second thing I would like to point out, however, is the butterfly effect, which is a big part of chaos theory in which a small change can lead to a huge variation in outcomes. For example, if Jack and Edward never looked in that bush where they found Faraday, they wouldn't have adopted him, they wouldn't have trained him, and ultimately Faraday would never have seen the butterfly and led himself and Jack to their deaths but also ultimately Edward's death. One small change can affect everything in later life. So not only is it great that it's a butterfly because of the connotational meaning of the insect, but also because it signifies that something is going to change Edward's life forever. All of this actually reminds me of the game Life is Strange, which is a great game you should play. The whole butterfly effect is reinforced when Edward is thinking about whose fault it was. Was it the butterflies? Was it Faraday's? The drivers? Jack's family? The woman who wrote the cat training book? Or himself and Jack? A small change that any of those people could have made may have changed the outcome of this entire scene. 
Now Edward's mum says that he isn't far off the world record for the world's smelliest man, but then Edward tells her there's this Iranian guy who hasn't washed in 60 years, and yes, that's true. Everyone thought it was this guy in India who hadn't showered in 30 years, but it was in fact Amu Haji, I hope I'm saying that right, in Iran who held the title. The big point here, however, is that the guy didn't shower because of some emotional setbacks early in his life. Another example of how small things can change uh, your entire life in a parallel to the way that Edward is feeling in this current moment. So here it gets a bit weird. The advertisement for the friendly faces appears and it simply can't be a coincidence. Here's why. Edward turns the telly on to the middle of a cleaning product ad and literally the next ad that comes on is about grieving lost pets. Would this kind of advert ever make it to television broadcasting? A commercial about reviving dead animals? Uh seems kind of inappropriate for daytime television. Edward points out that he feels like the Freddy is directly talking to him. He says, For a limited time only, an amazing deal just for you. And the fact that if you order in the next 30 minutes, you get free delivery. Freddy Fazbear even leans closer to put pressure on Edward. So my big question was, was this put on TV or was it directed to Edward? Edward gathers together some hair, but of course both Faraday's and Jack's hair were said to be black. That's why, of course, when it had been eight weeks with no package, Fazbear Entertainment said that there was a production anomaly. And they'd include a free coupon code for another order. This to me sounds awfully like special delivery, but they send out animatronics to people. Of course, the difference with special delivery is we know that Fanny turned off the security features uh, on the animatronics. When Edward does get the package, uh, he starts to open it and black clouds start to cover the sky. Of course, pathetic fallacy for what is about to happen in the story. Edward finds the abomination and sees that Jack uh, still has his natural smile, uh, but his face is white. Of course, the face is of a corpse. Now, in the Count the Ways video, we talked about how rigor mortis is the third stage of death concerning limb stiffness. Well, pallor mortis is the first stage of death where your skin goes completely pale in less than half an hour. This is due to lack in blood circulation and gravity causes all of your blood to sink to the fourth stage of death, liver mortis. It's now quite clear why Edward uh, wanted to be sick and bury the animatronic in his backyard. <laughs> it's literally a robot with a, a face of a human corpse stuck to it. Strangely, the book mentions how Edward feels as stiff as a corpse when he's in bed, but I don't think it, I don't think it holds any meaning. <laughs> now here, Edward seems to be experiencing something very similar to the gameplay of FNAF 4. He has a flashlight and shines it down the hallway to make sure the sounds he's hearing aren't anything bad. Interestingly, a huge variation of different sounds are made in the scene, which is quite a parallel to Faraday, who was previously mentioned, to have an extensive language. Language. Some of the sounds here are even quite similar to the ones mentioned at the beginning of the story. Now this is a bit of a weird one. Edward recites the digits of pi. However, I checked the true digits compared to his and weirdly he misses one out. Now here's where I'm stuck. Either this is somehow important and it just means Edward is scared or something and can't think straight, or the writers of the story completely messed up. There's a section that goes 169-399-37, but in the book, Edward says 169-3937. So he missed out on number nine. I don't know what to think of this. I think it might have been a typo, uh, and they didn't think that a nerd like me would come back and check, but I did, there you are. We get to the point where Edward is seeing Jack's face everywhere. The first place he looks is the same bush that they found Faraday in, creating closure with a contrast to the start of the book. But also, you may recall that in the commercial, Freddy said that the friendly face would follow you around forever. So I wonder if the same thing would happen if it was a normal pet's face on the animatronic instead of Jack's. It's also a good question on whether this is all just an illusion inside of Edward's head, or if it's actually real. I think it's a mix of both. 
Edward runs through the woods that was mentioned multiple times throughout this story uh, to be dangerous and dark. And when he comes out the other side, he gets hit by a truck, uh, just like Jack and Faraday. It's almost like Faraday this entire time was an antagonist. And by having people close to him, he could kill them by getting him hit by a truck. But I have no idea because the last line at the end of the story says that all the friendly face wanted to do was play with Edward. So is it villainous? or innocent? I think that's the question that you guys have to answer in the comments down below. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and you learned something in it. Maybe the digits of pi, I don't know. I really love this story and its small details were fascinating as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe so you'll see when I upload another video like this and I will see you all then. Goodbye.